to Second Thessalonians, second chapter, and we're also on page four hundred and forty-three in Lectures in Systematic Theology by Teason. What is Second Thessalonians? Second Thessalonians, two. Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about the second coming of Christ, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Now, there was the first coming and there's the second coming. And as it said here on page 442, you can't understand the Bible thoroughly until you get this second coming of Jesus straightened out in your head. There's not any way you're going to understand it. People can get saved and they can, they can be saved and everything, but you're not going to put your Bible together and understand what that book says until you get the chronology of what the Bible is talking about in the return of Christ. Do you believe in the return of Christ? We do believe that, don't we? We believe in the return of Christ. We, we believe he came the first time, but he's coming again. Now, how he's coming and what he's doing and and all about it, that's where all the mysterion is, the mystery, the mystery. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, our gathering together to him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by spirit or by the spirit. What spirit would that be? What spirit? Well, like an evil spirit. An evil spirit. An evil interpretation. An evil uh, uh, oracle, so to speak. <laughs> spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Now, the second coming of Jesus Christ and the day of the Lord are not the same, are they? Are they? Did Peter have some problems with it? Did John the Baptist have problems with this? Did they have problems with it? John the Baptist, just about the time he was going to die, sent an emissary of his students to Jesus to ask him if he was the Christ. Or are we supposed to look for another? And Jesus did not castigate him. He did not say that he's dumb. He did not say that you're not paying attention or you're ignorant. What did he tell him? You remember? Tell him that the, the blind see and the... John knew the Bible, didn't he? Yes. He knew the Old Testament scriptures. That's all the Bible there was. It wasn't any New Testament. This book wasn't written yet. All John had was the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, it'll come talk about the, summit, the, the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus and the glorious return of Jesus and the day of the Lord as if they're the same thing. But they're not. There are different periods of time. Now, <clears throat> there is the first coming of Christ. Did John get that messed up? Yes. Did even Peter get it confused? Yes. Did they think that Jesus is going to usher in this kingdom right then? Yeah. And how many years? There's at least a thousand and seven years between that. Or not a thousand seven. There's a thousand seven between here and the end of that. There's been two thousand years in the church age, and Jesus hasn't come back yet, has he? Has he? Not yet. Well, they got mixed up. There was the dispersion of Israel. That had to take place. Huh? Is that a reality? The dispersion of Israel. It was that a reality. Why was Israel dispersed? because they rejected their king and they were set aside. Now here we have the replacement theology problem, don't we? The church did not take and become the nation of Israel. Israel is Israel and the church is the church. Israel will always be Israel and the church will always be the church. In eternal ages to come, in eternity future, is Israel going to be Israel? Yes. What place in the economy of God in the eternal future will Israel be? The administrators during the millennium. 
There'll be administrators during the millennium. What will they be otherwise? Nation? They will still be a nation. And maybe David will be over them still. What about the church? What's the church going to do in eternity ages? <coughs> Vincent, what's the church going to do? Rule and reign. Rule and reign with what? With God. With Christ. Okay. Right. Yeah. With, a, with a, her, uh, her husband. She's going to sit on the throne with her husband forever. That's forever. Israel won't be there. Israel will never be the bride, will he? Israel's not going to get a chance to be the bride again. Now, what if they're uh, saved and baptized, though? That's, they're, they're not Israel, are they? If they come into covenant, church covenant relationship with if they're a Jew, you are no longer a Jew, are you? Nope. No longer Jew, no longer female, no longer male. Right. Don't matter. Become a Gentile. It, it, they can be in a closer relationship with God than they will as if they were Israel. Right. Right. Because of the, the bride is in intimate relationship with her husband. Right. Ruling and reigning with him. But there are other people there, aren't they? There are other people there. At the wedding feast, when the bride is consummated with her husband, are there guests there at the wedding? There sure are. They're not part of the bride, are they? No. They're guests. And it says, Blessed and holy he that is invited to the wedding supper mm -hmm. of the Lamb. It's not talking about, it's not, that's not the bride. Mm -hmm. Not the bride. The bride is the focus for a moment of that great point. In, in a wedding. You've been to weddings? You've, have you photographed weddings, Vincent? Uh, only one. Only one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because you're doing photographs all the time. Yeah. Well, what is the focus of the wedding usually? The bride. The bride. So what is the focus? Revelation, the 19th chapter, tells you that. The bride has made herself ready. And we're not talking about salvation there. We're talking about covenant relationship and intimate relationship mm -hmm. with Christ. What does it take to be part of the bride? What's it take? Everything. What did it take to be saved? The blood and the life and the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. But brideship is a different thing. Salvation and brideship are different. Now let's go back and read this again as we go on. We need to get these little categories all straightened out here in our minds. As if the day of the Lord has come. Now the day of the Lord is over here at this great glorious return of Christ. The grave of the Lord. Right there. Now at the end of the tribulation period the Lord is going to slay all of these rascals that ever rebelled against him. And those are those nations that will not submit. And that Satan is turned out and he goes out and temporarily uh, gathers up a, an army. We talk about the battle of uh, Armageddon. We talk about the, 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 um, the battle of Gog and Magog. Is the battle of Armageddon and the battle of Armageddon and Gog and Magog, is that the same battle? No. How far are they apart? At least a thousand years apart. But people will look at it sometimes as if it's the same event. It's not the same event. Let me go back over that again, okay? I want you to understand this. The battle of Gog and Magog and the battle of Armageddon are not the same battle. Right. And here is the battle of Armageddon right here, okay? And over here is the battle of Gog and Magog. And why is it called the battle of Gog and Magog? Where is Gog and Magog? Turkey. Where? Turkey. In Turkey. That today is the Islamic, well, what you might call the Islamic, used to be the Islamic Empire, or the, uh, or the, uh, the Muslim Empire, whatever you want to call it. It was the Caliphate. Was uh, Russia considered Magog? 
No. Uh, they, a lot of, of theologians believe that Gog and Magog was Russia. Gog and Magog is not Russia. Gog and Magog is in Turkey, Asia Minor. That is in the Islamic Empire, the Islamic, where the Islamic head was, and the Islamic Empire fell, the Caliphate fell down. When? 1920-something. They've still been kept to rise up. They're still in a lot of power all over the Middle East, aren't they? But they want to rise again. ISIS is wanting to reestablish the universal caliphate under Muhammad. That's why they're killing everybody all the time. You know, that's what the Mahdi and that's what the, the, the beast and the false prophet supposed to be doing according to Islam. Exactly what ISIS is doing. Well, there will be a, there will be a resurgence of that empire. And I think even at the end of this period of time, at the end of the thousand year reign when the battle of Gog and Magog is going to be basically these people. Now not one of them that was lost will go into the millennial reign will they? Yep. I know I'm covering a lot of time period here aren't I? Not one lost person will go into the millennium. Everyone's going to be saved and everyone's going to be believers. And that's another reason. Here we got people that believe in the tri tribulation mat, mat rapture, which I do. We got the mid tribulation rapture, and then we got the post tribulation rapture. If there's a post tribulation rapture, who's going to go into the millennium? Nobody. Nobody. Nobody to go. They're all. There's a rapture there, then who's going to go into the millennium? We, but we know that there's all these saved people. Now there's a rapture here. If there was a rapture in the middle, still we'd have somebody going in the millennium, but not at the end. Mm -hmm. That's post-tribulation rapture is not not possible. So we're eliminating some of these things, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Is this helping you? Some, I yep. hope. It took a lot of that. <coughs> That's this one very important part in it, Brother A. Yes, this part here. <laughs> Let's read on a little further. Let no one in any way deceive you. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed and the son of destruction. Now, this glorious return of Christ is not going to come. The rapture is not going to come. Okay. What happens in the church age? What's going on right now? Is the world getting better? No. Nope. Is the world getting better? No now, it. as we read through our book, we're going to see that people believe that the church will go out and convert the whole world and then will bring in the millennium. But it says differently here, doesn't it? What happens? It gets worse. It gets worse. The world's going to get worse. It's going to get real bad. Now, let's look at this. Let no one deceive you. That means lead you astray. It will not come unless the apostasy. What apostasy are we talking about? That means the stand apostasia. Apostasia is the Greek word. It comes right out of Greek apostasy. It means to stand away from. What are they standing away from? Standing away from God. That's when that guy declares himself as God, right? In the temple? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Apostasy. Has the gospel gone all over the world? Yes. yes, it has. I want you to understand. In the deepest, darkest parts of the Nile down in South America, in the deepest, darkest parts of the Nile, those people at one time have heard the gospel. Amen. When, matter of fact, those people that are so what they call so primitive, back in the Nile and, and those rivers back in there in, in, in Amazon, did you know at one time that those people weren't, didn't live like that? They didn't live like that. There were great populations of people down, great cities. And as the plagues of Catholicism came in during that period of time and the last three and four hundred years, Catholicism brought into those areas the Dark Ages. They just understand this now. These people made pottery and glass. They, the, the, these people were advanced civilizations, so to speak. But because of the persecution and disease 
and inbreeding and things, they were driven back into the regions that back far in there. And that one time, yes, they knew. All of those people have morality, don't they? There's no right from wrong. All of that. How about uh, the Ottoman Empire? You know, we're talking about the Ottoman Empire. Who was, uh, in the book of Revelation, who was the great foundational purveyors of the truth there in Asia Minor? The churches. The seven churches of Asia. Now, there was a whole lot more churches than that. But we talk about the seven churches of Asia from Ephesus through Laodicea. All of those were there. Did those people hear the truth? Yes. Now, who is ruling that area now? Islam. They rejected the truth. They rejected the truth. They know it, but they don't want it. The Bible has been corrupted according to them. Jesus... If you know what the worst sin you can commit in the world according to Islam is? What is the worst sin you can commit? Brother, it's a shirk. That's the term. Have you ever sh shirked, heard of the term shirked? That comes from Islam. Shirk. That term means to commit an unpardonable sin. Do you know what that unpardonable sin is? To believe in Jesus Christ. To say that Jesus Christ is God's son. That's the unpardonable. You you die. You say that in those countries. You die. You can not use the name of Jesus as we do it. Issa, Issa, as they call him, uh, is going to come back when the Mahdi comes on. They're looking for the Mahdi to come and look at see what it says here. And the, the apostasy comes for has the apostasy taken place? Did those people stand away from the truth? You can go over there in Turkey and these areas and you can go and study where the seven churches of Asia are and you can go on what we call biblical uh, trips and seminars. You can do that. But those churches are not there. They're not there. Christianity is not allowed in those places. You cannot openly pray to Jesus or in Jesus' name. You will die. Have they heard the truth? Did they stand away from the truth? Has that apostasy taking place? But what else has got to take place between now and then? First, the man of lawlessness, the outlaw, is revealed. Now, in the book of Revelation, it talks about who shut coming on the scene. The Antichrist. The Antichrist. And what else? Who's the other characters? Three characters. The beast. The beast. And what else? Dragon. The false prophet. The false prophet. Now, <clears throat> in the book of Revelation, are these guys good guys? No, they're not good guys. In Islam, are they good guys? In Islam, they're good guys. And the Bible talks about taking the mark of the beast. Now, if you take the mark of the beast according to the Bible, what have you done? Hmm? Carol? If you take the mark of the beast according to the Bible, what happens? You did condemn yourself to hell. There is no redemption. But now, if you are a, a Muslim, they want to take the mark of the beast. Did you know that? They want the mark of the beast. They want it. And what is the mark of the beast, according to them? What is the great cry of faith in Islam? There is no God but Allah. There is no Jehovah but Allah. He has no companion. And Muhammad is his prophet, or messenger, or apostle. That's the faith. And what do the jihadists wear? They have a streamer, a diadem, around their head, and what does it say on it? There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet, messenger. Well, it's pretty easy to put that together, and is that real difficult, Brother Ray? Now, every Muslim wants to take the mark of the beast. 
What does their end time thing say? This is where we are right here. Now we're going to cover this more later. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostrophe comes first, and then after that. <clears throat> and the man of lawlessness, who would this be? The great outlaw? The Antichrist. The Antichrist. <clears throat> now, according to Islam, the Antichrist is called the Mahdi. The one that fits this is the Mahdi. The Mahdi. And what is the Mahdi? What is he? Supposed to be like the reincarnation. He is going to be a reincarnation and a direct descendant of, descendant of Muhammad. Through his daughter. He's going to be a, a direct descendant and he's going to have the spirit of Muhammad in him. And he will be revealed out of Syria. This is where he's coming from. When he's 40 years old. And he'll be a reluctant leader. And, But the nations, all the Islamic nations will swear allegiance to him. And then who's going to back him up? Now the beast in the book of Revelation that talks about the beast... And the beast is really bad. But I'm going to try to remember what this beast looks like in this Islamic scripture. He's got the head of what? The lion. The head of a lion. The eyes of a pig. The ears of an elephant. The horns of a stag. The neck of an ostrich, the body of a lion, <clears throat> the tail of a ram, the front end of a cat and the back, or the, the front end of a cat and the back end, or the front end of a lion and the back end of a cat. And he's going to mark all the true believers with a mark of the name that. Of Allah. Now all of the believers in this system are going to want to take this mark. And they're going to be identified. No one will buy, no one will sell, well, no one will ever do anything in this world. You'll have no employment unless you have that mark. Or you take, swear allegiance to what? There is no God but Allah. He has no companion, no Jesus, no son. And Muhammad is his messenger. You've got to swear to that. Now what else? Now we, there's two people there. Now the, the beast is going to mark all these people. That's a really weird looking animal, isn't it? <laughs> Gruesome looking, ridiculous kind of. Boy, Muhammad had imagination, didn't he? And then what else? Who else is going to show up? Who's the third character? He's going to come out of Arabia with... The beast, Arabia, the desert of the sea. He's going to come out of there, and he's going to be Issa, or Jesus. And down in the Sea of Galilee, Brother Ray, they're going to find the Ark of the Covenant. The Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is going to be empty. They're going to find the Ark of the Covenant. And in all these writings and everything, is going to make sure that Muhammad is a true messenger of God. It's going to prove that he is a messenger of God. All of this. Now what's taking place with the Jews all this time? What happened to the Jews? There's a church around, by the way. Mm -hmm. Our church is gone. But now God's going to start dealing with the Jews. Now this Mahdi, he's going to come out and he's going to make a contract with the Jews. How long is the Mahdi, according to Islam, going to reign? Seven years. How long is Antichrist going to reign according to the Bible? Seven, Seven years. And his, his uh, helpers are going to be, the Antichrist is going to have a beast and he's going to have a false prophet. Now, was Jesus looked as, on as a prophet in Islam? Yes. Yeah. Whatever for whatever use he is. He doesn't know how to pray or anything according to them. Muhammad had to teach him everything. All he did was kind of been born and did miracles when he was a baby and 
and spoke from his crib and defended his mother and all this hogwash. Muhammad borrowed those stories. Yeah, he borrowed those stories from apocryphal scriptures, so to speak. Out of Arabia, the man of lawlessness is revealed and the son of destruction. The man of law, even the son of destruction. How many people has Islam killed in the world in the last several hundred years? 270 plus million people. How long, how many people did Catholicism kill? Between 50 and 100 million Christians. How big is that army of Armageddon? How big is it? How many, how, how big is it? You remember how many people's in there? How many people's in there? You remember how many people in the army? 200 million. How many Muslims are in the world? 1.7 billion. And by the way, everybody in Islam is a warrior from seven years old up. You think they can muster a 200 million dollar, million man army? There you go. Who, he who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God. There is no God but Allah. Do you understand that? There is no God but Allah. Above every God, above every God, even Jehovah, or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God. Now, according to Islam, and according to the Bible, the Jews are going to have a contract with this beast this, and this Antichrist for seven years. And they're going to build a temple in Jerusalem. And the Jewish sacrifices are going to be instituted again, aren't they? And I've said every one of those sacrifices is blasphemy to God because they stood for the Messiah, King of Israel. He was the only Lamb of God, the last Lamb of God. And after three and a half years, just like the Bible says now, right in the middle of that, there are you can donate to that temple that you know that's going to be built in Jerusalem. You can go online right now and donate to that temple. Did you know that? You can donate to that temple right now. But whose temple is that going to be? Antichrist. It's going to end up being the Antichrist temple. And er, er, before that, you know, Islam has got the biggest propaganda machine out there in the world. It's the only religion in the world that tells you they don't believe what they believe and they don't practice what they practice. Isn't that something? It is a worldwide propaganda machine to tell you they do not believe what they believe and they do not practice what they practice. But we see it on the news every day. Do you know how many Christians are being killed every day in the Middle East and all over these nations and Africa and everything in the name of Islam? Every day? You don't hear about it. You know why? Because the news media won't report it all. You'll hear about something now and then, but you won't hear about the everyday happenings. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things, and you know that what restrains him now so that he is, in his time, he may be revealed? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Is it already at work here in the church age? Mm -hmm. Well, the church, we've been having, the churches have been having quite a trouble with it, haven't they? Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. Now what happens? Now we're covering a what we might call an overview 
like a mountaintop view looking down on valleys. I took Marilyn up high in the White Mountains the other day, didn't I, Marilyn? We went up high. We were up about 12,000 something feet, around 12,900 actually. And you look over there to the east, and you see one mountain range after another mountain range after another mountain range after another mountain range until you can see all the way to the state of Utah. All across Nevada and all the mountain ranges because you're higher than all of them. And you're looking down on the world, looking down like from outer space or something. And you look over there and on a clear day you can see all the way into Utah. Utah. That's what we're doing right now. We're going like on top of White Mountain. We're looking all the way through the whole church age. Now, <clears throat> on the day of Pentecost, what happened, Marilyn? On the day of Pentecost, what happened? They were unconfused for a little while. But what happened there, Sharon? What happened? The church was empowered by the comforter. And the comforter came upon the church. And the comforter is in the church. The power of God is in that church today. That church had the power to receive the words of God that we are reading tonight. That all came in that comforter. Holy men of God spake as they were what? Urged by the Holy Spirit. And that's these words we're reading tonight. Paul says here in the second chapter, again, let's go back for earlier. Now we request you, brethren, in regard to the coming of our Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. What's that? That's the rapare in Latin. That's the rapture. Mm -hmm. Hapoxo. The hapox. The rapture. <coughs> now, at the end of this church age, now what are you going to see? What is the thermometer? What is the kind of the tally mark of when the church age is coming to an end? What's going to happen? Israel, no? Israel again. The regathering of Israel. Okay, now do Israel, does Israel believe? They're in their land, aren't they? Mm -hmm. But do they believe? No. No, they don't believe. Basically, there either there are Orthodox Jews, which are the same thing as Pharisees there, but the people that are running the show, a lot of them are what? They're Sadducees. They are atheist Jews that believe that they have a prominent place in the world and they're going to take place to show you how to live. And that's their idea. They think that the whole dis diaspora, the whole uh, exodus of them, from the time of Nebuchadnezzar was to show the world how wonderful those people are and to be a witness to them how they live. Everybody's supposed to live kosher. Everybody's supposed to wear these little things and do all of this. This is the way you get close to God is acting like a Jew. Now, <clears throat> In history, there have been some real weird ducks. Stephen, or Simon. There was a guy named Simon one time. Over there in Asia Minor. Out there in, in the country. He went out there in the country, this guy did. And he's get a calling of God. God's called him. And he's going to do this fantastic thing that God has called him to do. So he goes out there and climbs on to up on this pillar, Brother Ray, on this pillar. And he sits up there and he prays and blesses everybody that comes around. He doesn't come down off the pillar. He's just something up there. And he's up there for over 30 years. And they attribute everything, all these great miracles to him because they come and they pray and they look up at this guy he's got long fingernails and hair all over the place and setting up their skin and bones and looking like some owl or something but he's a holy man 
holy man. People can get some real weird ideas of how to be holy. Yeah. You know what? That's not being holy. I think that's being nuts. Mm -hmm. They should have got up there and drug him off and put him in some insane asylum someplace. Yeah. But people would pray to him. They'd write letters about him. They wrote letters all over the Middle East about this wonderful guy. This Simon. You know, this wonderful guy. And then years later, another one tried the same thing. It didn't last as long. That boy went up there when I think he was seven years old up on this pillar. Can you imagine anything as ridiculous as that being called religion, brother? That's like Buddha. Yep. Sitting out there under a the tree, eating one grain of rice at a time. <laughs> one grain of rice a day. And Buddha was sitting there, this is according to Buddha's legend now, Buddha was sitting there and he was about to die. They could see his heart beating in his chest. He was just nothing but bones and skin. Nothing. You, you could see his organs through his skin. He's sitting there just almost ready to die. And this girl comes up there with some soup. And he's sitting there thinking how smart he is and how holy he is. Because he's denying himself of all of these pleasures of being with his wife and children and all of this and and he's afraid he's going to be reincarnated. Have you ever heard of Nirvana? You heard of Nirvana? Have you heard of that? Vincent Nirvana? He wants to go into Nirvana. You know what Nirvana is? Annihilation. He was afraid that he was going to be reincarnated into an elephant, a lion, a tiger, or a flea, or a tick, or a fish, or something. This is what I call the migration of souls. But he wanted to go into oblivion so he could rest. And the only way he could do this was sit out there and deny himself of all earthly pleasure. But this little girl comes up to him and sets a bowl of soup down there by him. And he looks at that bowl of soup and he smells of it. Now, I'm ready to die here. My heart hardly will beat anymore because I've only been eating one grain of rice a day for like five or ten years he's slowly dying now I'm so smart I've shown these people the way now if I die right now and go out of existence I'll be gone in nirvana but what about my message so he decides to eat that bowl of soup and he eats the bowl of soup and he revives <laughs> miraculously and he tells now all of his other nuts that are around him are all sitting around under trees starving to death eating a bowl you know a grain of rice a day but he gets a new revelation he said wow you know these Buddhist colonies around you know they're all over there are out three or four of them out there by and where I live out there in the country Now, they won't work. They live in a colony and they go out and do things. They have fruit trees and different things like that. This false religion we're talking about. Evil things. This is evil. These are evil. This is evil. This uh, man decides that he's going to live, and he's, but the only way he's going to live now He's not going to eat a grain of rice anymore, Vincent, a day. But what he's going to do now is he's going to beg for food, and he's going to tell, pre, tell people his message, and he's going to beg them for food, and they can give him one bowl of food a day. But he has to beg for it. He can't buy it, and he can't work for it. All he's got to do is give his message of oblivion and peace. These are false messages, aren't they? Has the false messages gone out? Has the world been absolutely deluged in lies about religion? They keep changing it, too. Yeah. Well, the Jehovah Witnesses, they say they're Jehovah Witnesses, but the Jehovah is Jesus, and they're witnessing against him. All of these things. Let's go on and read a little bit further. 
for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. This is what we're talking about, false religion. Buddha, Charles Taze Russell, Joseph Smith, all the popes. All this false religion. And the truth trying to trudge through all of this garbage pit of human ideas. As already at work, only he that now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. What's that talking about? What is restraining everybody from becoming a Buddhist or a Muslim? The Holy Spirit of God. How come even in those Middle East countries, every now and then there's a convert? How come there's a convert every now and then to Christianity? And what do you pay for being a convert in those countries, uh, Vincent? What does it cost you? Your life. I was listening to a, a Muslim, converted Muslim. He's not a Muslim anymore, he's a Christian. And he was talking about being in a village one time in his country. He was a, he was a soldier from the time he was five years, seven years old. He was a soldier when he was five, but he was a real killer by the time he was seven. And he killed people. He was part of the organizations over there. And he said in this one village that the, the soldiers had come in there, American soldiers had come in there, and they said, where's the bad guys? To this little boy. He's only five years old, six, seven. Where's the bad guys? What bad guys? You know the ones that's killing people. Oh, right over there. So they went over there and shot up a few of them up. The boy, his father, honor killings. Said they don't do that, you know. Islam is the only nation in the world, or the only religion in the world, that has a propaganda machine to tell you that they don't do what they do. They don't practice what they practice, and they don't believe what they believe. This father took before the city council, the tribe, they're all tribal. He took his little son, and he took him before the people, and he told him what the little boy had done. And the little boy sitting up there, and he said, Daddy, 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 Daddy. He was afraid the little boys were right because everybody was looking at him bad, like they wanted to kill him. So the father takes a rope, and he ties it around the little boy's neck. The little boy's like this. The father's taller. And the little boy's screaming, Daddy, 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 Daddy. And he picks the little boy up by his neck and pops his neck like that and breaks his neck. And he drops on the floor. That's an honor killing. Now what is restraining that from happening all over the world today? What is keeping the gospel message alive in all of this muddy muck of religious sewer in the world? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Now, as the comforter, as the work in this age, in the church age, the Holy Spirit as it's a work in the church age today, that's what's keeping it behind, yeah. keeping him from coming into the world. And then that lawless one will be revealed when he's at who restrains is taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit will not quit working in the world. I want you to know that. But the Holy Spirit as a comforter to the true churches and to the preaching of the gospel will be taken away at this period of time, gone. Now, when the rapture takes place, I really believe in the first part of that, for the first several months after the rapture, that there's going to be a great conversion in the world. Without the comforter, but boy, what's going to happen in the world? What's going to take place? The lawless one will kick it in total control. Total control. 
And those true believers are going to have to die. We know that the Jews are going to live for a while. Maybe the Catholics are going to remain all right. The churches will still be going in the cities and ringing their bells and having their services. The ones that don't believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and the only truth way and I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he said. This lawless one is going to be coming in accord with the activity, the energizing of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders and deception. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they do not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. And for this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence. He will allow this deluding influence to come upon them. Satanic powers will be turned loose tremendously. The Holy Spirit will still work with his word, but not as the comforter, not as it is today, not the administration of the Holy Spirit as comforter will not be there, but people will be saved. People will die. That will be the washing machine. Yeah. God is going to run Israel through the washing machine and clean their Judaism out of them <laughs> through this. In this book, it says the second coming, the, as Christ is prophet, priest, and king, is uh, the key to the scriptures. It talks about two resurrections, which we talked about. The resurrection here. Then we're going to have a resurrection of the, what we might call the, the martyrs. Tribulation, tribulation period martyrs. And then at this end of this tribulation, at the end of the millennium, there's going to be a great right white throne judgment and the final great white throne resurrection. That's where all the lost people will be raised. <coughs> now, unless you understand the millennium, you can never understand the Sabbath. Sabbath. What does Sabbath mean? By the way, Sharon, do you remember what Sabbath means in Hebrew? Sabbath. It means completion. completion. The Sabbath is the completion of the week. It's done. Now, Israel, God taught all the way back to the garden about the Sabbath, didn't he? Now, if we don't understand what that Sabbath meant, we will get miss the whole reason for the Sabbath. I know people today that are still keeping the Sabbath today. Seventh-day Adventists. And your Jews still keeping the Sabbath today. But what does that Sabbath represent? What does it represent? Vincent, what's it represent? What does the Sabbath represent? What does it mean? What's it pointing to? The Lord Himself. The millennial reign that the whole earth rests for a thousand years. Restored. It's going to rest. This is a Sabbath year. The Sabbath. A thousand years of Sabbath thousand years, a thousand years of Sabbath. That whole rest, the earth will rest from the influence of Satan. That whole thousand years of Sabbath. Now what Romans says, huh? the earth is going to be redeemed. Well, Barnabas, <coughs> Barnabas, now this is a, what we call an extra biblical book. And we can't believe everything in the book of Barnabas, but I'm going to tell you one thing the book of Barnabas says that makes sense. He said that for 6,000 years the man would live on the earth from here to here. But the 7,000 years, the, the last 1,000 years, that 7,000 years would be a Sabbath unto the Lord, which is the reign of Christ, the 1,000 year reign of Christ. The earth will rest from the influence of Satan. The earth will rest from all the influence of, of the demonic spirits. It will rest from it for that thousand years. How about baptism and the Lord's Supper? If you don't understand uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper, how can you understand the second coming of Christ? What does the second coming of Christ represent? When you're baptized, you replies what? What did I say to you when I baptized you, Marilyn? You remember what I said to you, Sharon? Well, it's death, burial. Buried in, with Christ in baptism, raised unto newness of life. 
death, burial, and resurrection. What's the last one? Anastasia, resurrection. Without second coming Christ, we have no resurrection. People will really, there is no hope without the resurrection, which the gospel represents the death, burial, and resurrection of God. 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, baptism typifies and portrays the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. How about the Lord's Supper? What about the Lord's Supper? What does it represent? What, what do we do in the Lord's Supper? You remember, Vincent? What do we do in the Lord's Supper? Remember his death. Until when? What's that? Until when? The church is supposed to remember his death, burial, and resurrection until when? until the end of the church age once you have it with him again. The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper wouldn't mean anything if we didn't have a resurrection, would it? Until the church was resurrected. When are we going to have that supper with Jesus? When are you going to sit down with Jesus? In that city. All the Jews, right at, at, at the Passover dinner, supper, Sadar, cedar, however you want to say that, they sat there and they set a plate for Elijah because they're still looking for Elijah. Now Jesus said, who was Elijah? John the Baptist was Elijah that was to come and to point and portray and to herald forth the coming of the king and make straight the way of his pathways. Okay. Jesus at the Last Supper, as we know it, and at the Passover, at the cedar that he took with his church, by the way, before it happened, a little for early. He took that Passover with that church. And what did he say? I will not take this supper with you again until what? Until I come in my kingdom. The second coming in the kingdom. What's going to take place up here for seven years in heaven? the marriage feast of the land where he rests with his bride and all the saved are enjoying this supper with Jesus again. That's what it's all about. Without the coming of Christ and without the resurrection, there is no supper. There's no reason. There, there's Now what do the Jews say each year? And what the Jews say each year is when they go and they finish it, they drink their cups and everything, and they say, next year what? Next year in Jerusalem. But Jesus said, it's not next year in Jerusalem. I will not take this personally with you. Jesus is not in the cup, Brother Ray. He's not in the bread. He's not transubstantiated. He's not consubstantiated. Jesus will be with us. That represents him. We do that in memory of him. But that memorial dinner represents that he's coming back again to receive us unto himself. And then we will sit down and we will really sup with him and drink with him at that supper with Jesus. And I'm wondering about this. Do I got to lay on my belly when I eat up at the table or we're going to sit and cheer? Pull up a carpet. Are we going to look like uh, the Last Supper sitting at cheers or are we going to be laying up to a table on cushions? Going to be a long table in there in New Jerusalem, isn't it? Long table. Approximately 1,500 miles by 1,500 mile city. I'll tell you about that later too, how big that is. How many stories. That's going to take up a lot of space. 1,500 miles, and not, not quite 1,500 miles, but 1,500 miles, but 1,500 miles, but 1,500. That's city four square. And what are we going to do there? We're going to take that Lord's Supper. But we won't get it until he comes. Right. We're not going to have it until he comes. And the second coming of the Lord is not in our death, as it says in the book. We'll look at that. But starting on page uh, 444 the next time. Vincent, what song do we have tonight? 524. 524. If you're out there and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can. You might understand these great mysteries. 
when you come to know the Lord. And as we unfold and uncover these, as the book of Revelation said, that uncovering, the unveiling of all the things that Jesus Christ means. Brother Vincent. Mm -hmm. Just as I am without one thing, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Thank you, Vincent. Our Father, we send this message out for your honor and for your glory. Touch hearts with it. Watch over our students and our fellows in love and in truth all over the world. Touch each and every one of their hearts. Australia, China, Wales, England, France, Germany, Israel, Arabia. Father, I look down every month and I see how many times this last month we covered all 50 states and 70 countries. That's a lot of people, Father. And I know you're touching each and every one of their lives out there as your word goes out. I pray that you build them up in the Lord, that you convict them of sin, righteous, judgment to come, and that they will truly be saved. And when they are saved, that they will serve you and love you and look forward to you and remember the words you give to us here. Forgive us where we fail you. Forgive me where I fail you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I got a to announcements.